Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you ever played the game Jenga? The concept is simple. You build a tower out of small wooden blocks in stacks of two, with with each level going in the opposite direction as the one previous. And that way, the strength of the tower that's being built is stronger. But once you reach the end of your blocks, near the top of your tower, it's time to change things up. Each player is now called to pick out one piece of that tower at a time. It's a fine way to pass the time and have some fun. And there is, with every game, there is also a competitive side to this game. And in the end, everyone knows that the game is over. And everyone knows who lost. Because that takes place when the tower that was built comes crashing down. Well, there are truths that we can see being revealed and discussed in our gospel reading for tonight. And in the parable that Jesus teaches, he calls us to look at life in a way similar to that of a game of Jenga. Build up, attention, and at least from the world's perspective, the identical ending. This parable is known as the parable of the rich fool, but it did not come out of nowhere. As with the many other parables that Jesus shared, this one was also inspired by a question from the crowds of people who followed and listened to Jesus. It came from people who were likely not too much different than you or I am when it comes to Jesus. We are at least intrigued by him. How does he ever respond to every question that is posed? And how is it that not every answer he gives resolves every question we have? Yet we are pleased, or at least okay, with all that he says. Well, what was the question posed of our Lord in our text this evening? A man approached him and said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. According to the law of Moses, under the Old Covenant, the very law that all believing Jews living in Jesus' day lived under, the oldest son was granted half of everything his father had, moment of his death. Before getting into the response that this questioner no doubt wanted desperately, Jesus first, however, points this man to the truth that he is, in fact, God. Man, he said, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Of course, Jesus needed no human to place him as judge or arbitrator. He will return to this world in judgment. He will return as an arbitrator over who is sinful and whose sin counts against them and whose does not. We know, as God's people, that all those who hold on to their sin by means of the ultimate and unforgivable sin of unbelief will answer for them in eternity. We confess this hard truth. Every time we confess our faith, it is in the creed, which summarize that which we believe through God's word in our baptism. He will come again to judge both the living and the dead. He will come with the eternal scales of justice. All those who are holding on to the assurance that the things of this world might offer will answer for that in the second death, as they experience the bodily resurrection, the eternal separation from God's love. So who made Jesus a judge or arbitrator? Well, he has held this position from before the dawn of time, will hold on to it into eternity, and his ruling will stand forever. So then, what is the verdict? He gives us a parable to help us understand. He says, the land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? We look at this and we might laugh. This is what many people today would call a good problem. It is, however, a complicated matter if you're picking the way the world thinks. And the man in our parable followed this line of thought. He said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. This man has so much that he doesn't know what to do with it. His plan, then, is to knock down everything he has to hold on to what he thinks is his own. His plan is to protect his earthly wealth by earthly means. So 
bigger bonds, bigger accounts, fancier money management. I don't know what to do with it. They'll help him to better plan for retirement and easy living. They'll assure him that he has everything he needs to do exactly that. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. His work is done. They'll tell him that there is nothing else to do other than live off of what he has accomplished to his heart's end. But earthly financial advisors cannot give what every single person needs. They cannot tell us when our earthly treasures will need and do nothing for us. Only God knows this individualized truth for each one of us. And now, God begins to speak. Fool, he says, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Once this man is dead, this bigger barn full of all the grain and riches he has accumulated will mean nothing. I hope he wrote the rock solid will. I hope his lawyer helped him map out a plan for this dark day that no one can avoid or deny. Once death touches us, everything we think was ours no longer holds any value to us. And this is why God calls this man a fool. This world is that includes everything the creating God has seen fit to give you by earthly standards. That includes everything that you think is yours, because it isn't yours. Many trained professionals have received portions of earthly wealth, helping you determine where your wealth and possessions can be used and could ultimately end up. But what many of them don't exactly dwell on is what this parable will not teach. You and I are but stewards. Nothing you have will go with you beyond your death. And this applies to whatever power or control the world has seen fit to share with you. This applies to whatever it is that you keep under your roof. This includes anything in your wallet and in any bank account with your name on it. None of this will follow you into the dark. It's not going with you. It isn't yours. What should we do with it? We should use it. We should use it not for our comfort, but for God's glory. We should use it to further his work and his kingdom. We should use it to share the only truth that this world has ever encountered. We can use it to proclaim that death comes to every living being, and that once it comes, there is nothing that any living being can hold on to after that point. And so our parable has ended. The man in it is a fool. Anyone who thinks like he does is a fool. And whatever you might have told an estate planner will certainly happen upon your death. But as whatever you insist be included as a companion piece to your casket will be of no worth to you. It will be placed in that box along with your dead body, and it will hold no value when you are able to look at it once again. The sound of the trumpet of the Lord as you and all the dead in fact, there is only one thing that we can call our own that matters in that moment of time. That which matters more than anything is that which was given to you, your holy body. That which matters more is not your work or your labor or your sweat. All of them, in fact, led you to your death. Worldly wealth will fade. It will crash down like the Jenga tower that started out looking so solid. And at the moment of this, this world's judge and arbitrator's return, that moment will fade to waste, to streaks of gold. So don't hold onto anything in this life beyond the faith that God has given you. Don't be miserly or greedy. Don't think that your riches will be anything to you in eternity. Instead, use it here in this life and leave it to the only God and Father of us all. Share it generously both in your life and beyond your death so that his word can continue to be taught and spread to sinners in need of forgiveness. <clears throat> Trust that Christ's church will use it to bring more people into the faith through his grace. It doesn't come to any one of us or anyone at all by hard work. Everything you have in this world which you place your hands on and which you attribute value to will one day fade. But the one important gift given to you by a triune God 
which is yours by his work alone, the thing you fear has far over value. There is a day coming in which Christ will judge all those who live and die in this world, and he will not be looking for worldly wealth or wisdom. None of that means anything to him. Instead, he will be looking for all those who look to his cross as the only solution for that which put them in the grave. He will look for his gift of faith, which is not a human work, but a divine work. He will look to those who, by faith, trust that by his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave, he has overcome whatever false promises this world might construct. So fear that faith. Don't hold on to him. Hold on to the eternal promise of eternal life. Hold on to the assurance that only Christ can take you from this valley of peace, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the life. This promise is yours, and it is one of joy. You are connected to this promise every time you turn to this holy scripture. It is yours every time you confess your sins and lean on that which was given to you at the baptismal font. It is yours every time you come forward to this altar and receive the true body and blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ. No dollar amount will save you. Yes, it can give you earthly comfort and security. Yes, it can give the false promise that you have everything you need. And yes, it will crumble and fall. At the cross, the truth was delivered through Christ's willing sacrifice. And he walked out of his grave financial plan or will. And he walked out of his grave in order that you might walk out of yours. Amen. We join together now in singing the offertory as printed in our bulletin.